say, well, what would happen if the price of Y changed? Well, Y, we just said a while ago, Y is a substitute, right? A substitute in consumption. Can you give me another word for that? I mean, what is company Y, the company that makes Y, how, how are we related to them in the marketplace? Are we friends or enemies? Competitor. We're enemies. They're competitors. And so, hopefully, we're keeping an eye on our competition. We're seeing what they're doing. And maybe we pick up some inside intelligence, right? One of their senior employees is down at the local nightclub and has a few too many drinks and happens to reveal in the process to some of his friends that we over here that they're planning to raise their prices in about a month by 6%. What would that do to our sales? That's the kind of question we're asking. Okay. In order to analyze that, we're going to look at right now just three types of elasticities. Uh, if this is stuff you learned a long time ago and you haven't seen in a while, it's all on YouTube. It goes through all of the elasticities. There's also some handouts on Angel that explains all this stuff. Okay. So I'm taking it as a given right now. When I say the own price elasticity of demand, you understand what I mean. What that is, by the way, is the percentage change in our sales. The percentage change in our sales when we have some percentage change in our price. If we raise price by 10%, would that be a good thing or a bad thing? What do you think? Bad thing, Connie? Go with it. I mean, it would increase the price. Yeah. That would be a bad thing for us to do? Yeah. Why? It'll decrease the quantity. It'll decrease the amount we sell, but will we make more money or less money? Because we're selling fewer young units, but at a higher price. Will we make more money or less money? It depends. It depends on what? On where it is. On the it depends on the price elasticity of demand. And I'm kind of reviewing this right now. If the price elasticity of demand is greater than 1, this is what you probably need to review. Anytime I raise my price, my total revenue, my sales revenue, decreases. So that may or may not be a good idea, but I would like to know what's going to happen. Um, the other side of that, if my price elasticity of demand is less than 1, Anytime I raise my price, I make more money. What does that tell you? What is that? What do we call that kind of demand? Inelastic. It's an inelastic demand with a coefficient, this coefficient. And that coefficient is less than one. I'm sorry, what does the TR stand for? The who? The TR. Is it the TR. Where's the TR? Total revenue. Oh, total revenue. I'm sorry. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah, you got to slow me down once in a while. I'm not always... Okay. Uh, Two feet on the ground floor. Um, would this be good news or bad news? If we had an inelastic demand for our product, what kind, of, what kind of product might have an inelastic demand? Medical. Medical medicine. Mm -hmm. Why? What does it mean? You have to have it. It means you've got to have it, and if they raise the price, you're going to keep buying it, so they're going to make more money. Medicine? What else? Give me a specific one. Let me tell you what I know. Not household, but gasoline. Yeah. What happens when the price of gasoline goes up? You and I just stop driving and cut no. back driving? No, uh uh. What do we do? We drink cheaper beer and we still buy the damn gasoline because we got to go around in our cars. Um, liquor. Liquor has an inelastic demand. As prices go up, people still keep buying it. That's why we tax the hell out of it. Well, we could tax groceries because people got to buy them. Would that be fair? That would heavily penalize particularly lower income people. And so in the state of Florida, groceries and medicines are not taxed. It used to be in the state of Alabama, clothing was not taxed because it was seen as being a necessity. People got to have it, and if you tax it, you're really punishing the lower income folks who have to have that stuff. Okay? So yeah, this would be good news. So we'll be looking for this as we go along. What I want to do now, we'll talk about cross-price elasticity, which is about substitutes or complements. And then we'll talk about income elasticity, which is 
about what happens to our sales if incomes change. This one here, sigma xy, is the percentage change in our sales, quantity demanded of x, when there is some percentage change in the price of another good, let's say y. And if you, if you looked at my handouts or you have notes from your microeconomics class, these percentage change things should look a little familiar. Income elasticity, and these are my symbols, by the way. This is the little Greek letter sigma. And the author uses this notation for the, with the textbook we're using right now. So if you see this in the textbook, this is what Strickland's using, okay? I think mine are easier to, to comprehend, but maybe that's because I've been using them so long. Income elasticity. What's the percentage change in our sales of good X if there is some percentage change of income? What do you think would happen to the sales of our product if people started making more money? Would they buy more of it or would they buy less of it? If it's normal, they buy more. What's a normal good? One that people want more of when they have more money. Good. A normal good, and most goods are, quote, normal means when people's incomes rise, they buy more of that product. All right? Steak, lobster, furniture, appliances, normal goods. When people's income go up, they buy more. Good beer. Good beer, as opposed to other beer. <laughs> Give, then what is an inferior good? One that one, people want less of as their incomes go up. Yeah, and not that we're talking about the quality of the product. We're talking about people's behavior when their income changes. If their income goes up, they buy, buy less of the inferior good. Typical inferior goods would be ramen noodles, uh, Spam, the meat product, or maybe generic products. Mobile homes. <laughs> mobile homes. Are mobile homes an inferior good? Maybe. If people had more money, they would not buy mobile homes. They'd buy something else. Is that true? Yeah. The ones that you ride. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, no, I'm talking about the ones you live in. Mobile home. Trailer. Trailer. Oh, okay. Yeah, not the mobile home is not mobile, right? Made by two and connected. I'm sorry. <laughs> by two and connected. You bet. <laughs> so adding on, expanding, <laughs> renovating. Are mobile homes truly an inferior good? I don't think so because something still happens. You really are an inferior good. If you had a mobile home dealership and the economy was doing good, don't we wish, and people were, were seeing their incomes rise, that'd be bad news for you, huh? I think generally that's true. Can you imagine a circumstance in which a mobile home is an inferior good? That if people have more money, they would buy less. Yeah, I, oh. I think that, that's an When would a mobile home be a normal good? I'm sorry. After a hurricane. After a hurricane, if your house is devastated and you've got more money, you go out and buy a mobile home to live in until you rebuild your home. I, it always occurred to me this way. If my 29-year-old son or daughter was still living at home, working part-time and laying on the couch expecting me, me to pay for his cell phone, his car insurance, and his gasoline, a mobile home would be a normal good. Because if I made a little bit more money, I'd buy a mobile home and I'd put it out in the backyard and I'd shift his lazy ass out there. <laughs> Okay? So is a mobile home a normal good or an inferior good? It depends on the circumstances of the buyer. But we want to know about our good, by the way. Whatever product we have to be selling, we want to know. Is it normal or inferior and to what extent? How sensitive are our sales to changes in incomes? Are there variables in these economics equations that take into account factors like circumstances? Well, yeah. You ever heard the phrase, uh, figures don't lie, but accountants do? Uh, okay. Well, these are economists. They're numbers. You can calculate them. You always get the same answer. They don't lie. Mm -hmm. But the economists who put the equations together will build them sometimes to suit their own ends. Okay. Sometimes they can account for some of those variations. Sometimes not. Okay? So we're going to play games with these things over here in just a minute. Let me, uh, let me create a little bit of operating room.